Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. We do so by painting an accurate picture of that journey from the perspective of the justice-involved individual. Too often, our perceptions of those individuals are tainted by media-driven caricatures created to sell newspapers or movie tickets. This adds little to a healthy dialogue as to how to best address criminality and the reintegration process. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello, and welcome to episode 70 of the Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. As previously noted, I have some blockbuster guests lined up for you all in the coming weeks and months, and the hit parade begins with today's very special guest. I have known our next guest for close to 10 years now. Brad Bogue is the founder and director of JSAT, which stands for Justice System Assessment and Training out in Boulder, Colorado. Brad is a consultant in criminal justice, leveraging 40 years of professional experience in corrections, mental health, and substance abuse treatment to assist organizations in finding better alignment with evidence-based practices and to provide support and guidance for agencies to train their organizations to meet minimum thresholds in the use of multiple interventions, including motivational interviewing, cognitive coaching, and case planning with a high degree of fidelity. Brad is only a handful of LSCMI master trainers in the United States, myself included in that small group, of course. Brad, however, is also the only LSCMI master trainer who's also been certified in the hair psychopathy checklist. And on top of all that, Brad is also a recognized mint trainer. So if you are familiar with motivational interviewing, you know all about that mint credential, the motivational interviewing network of trainers. Brad has published over a dozen articles. He's written three books on working with justice involved individuals. He has been hired by state, county, and local corrections agencies to design and develop systems which track all coding, coaching, training, communities of practice, and other practice models, leveraging his extensive experience and knowledge with implementation science. Brad has an exceptional track record in assisting agencies to develop sustainable implementation capacity. I could talk all day about Brad's credentials, but I don't want to steal more time than I need to from this great conversation that I recently had with him. Please enjoy my fascinating chat with Mr. Brad Bogue, and I will see you all on the other side. Well, welcome to the show, Brad. I've known Brad for about 10 years in various iterations. Brad's here to talk to us today about maybe taking a look at the sanctimony of the need principle. Brad, before we go there, first of all, go ahead and introduce yourselves to the audience, you know, maybe a little about yourself educationally, vocationally, maybe a bit about Jason if you like, but then Maybe why don't we kick this off because there are some folks who may not be as familiar with the risk and need responsivity model. So before we do a deeper dive on the need principle, would you mind again, maybe introduce yourself um, and then we can start by just giving those folks sort of a view at 10,000 feet of those three interlocking principles that make up the R&R approach. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Brad Bogue and I'm a uh, one of my roles is the director of justice system assessment and training, a company I started uh, about yeah, 25 years ago. And in uh, uh, terms of my background, um, well, first I want to say that I'm very uh, feel honored and flattered, silly um, to be uh, invited to share and hold forth on it on something that's important to me. Um, uh, and uh I've recently listened to some of the podcasts and um, was quite impressed. So it puts a little pressure on me today. But um, uh, 
I, I have ways of lowering the bar for myself. So one of them is just telling myself. So I started in the field in 1971. And uh, I started working as a counselor in a therapeutic community based in New York. And that didn't last very long. In fact, it was only a few weeks. Um, and then the next time I worked in a, with criminal justice populations after that was with juveniles in uh, Newport News, Virginia. And I worked for a program <clears throat> there called Alternatives, Inc. Um, and it was a startup. And I, I really love uh, getting involved in starting up programs. And uh, I was there for about nine months. And uh, Alternatives, Inc. is still going strong. And it's twice won the CSAP Program of the Year Award. It's a, it's a really uh, wonderful, wonderful program where they, they help the kids learn how to run the program themselves in a way. And it's, it's, um, it's really marvelous how, how it tuned that, that, that program and how resilient it's been. Anyway, I, um, <clears throat> return, I didn't work for, again for the field until 1982, and I've been working ever since. And I started at line staff and worked... Uh, um, you know, security, worked uh, as a case manager, worked as uh, assistant program director. Then I got a job um, not working in, in operations anymore, but working for the state oversight, the Division of Criminal Justice in Colorado, and um, was in charge of auditing and evaluating community corrections across the state. And then I moved from there to a special project with probation in, in the judicial system about uh, bringing in um, a standardized assessment. And I was the first trainer in the U.S. in the LSI, R, as you understand it. And, um, and for, that pro for the purposes of that project. And then not long after that, within a year, I became the first mint in the criminal justice system, um, along with another fellow that came in from uh, Oklahoma. Um, so, um, and then in 1997, I think it was, I left my position as a manager in judicial probation, uh, feeling that after five years, we've kind of successfully implemented the standardized assessment and then uh, started my company because I saw the future was probably going to be, be tied to evidence-based practices. And I was feeling somewhat passionate about that. The breakthrough for me, uh, well, there were so many, and some of them were personal, interpersonal with mentors along the way. Um, but one of the conceptual breakthroughs was the introduction in the, based on the meta-analysis of Bonta and Andrews and John Dro and a few others were involved in that as well. But their conclusion that the, uh, the, uh, the cornerstone principles of case classification were risk, what they call the risk principle, the need principle, responsivity, and also professional override. So when we say R&R, &R, sometimes I'm thinking I'm here and this is the beginning of a, you know, a pirate thing, you know, R&R, well, &R, right? You know, but <laughs> I, you know, I still get confused when I hear it, that shorthand because it's so uh, succinct. But risk principle is really simply that uh, it, using actuarial tools, if we assess the risk of different various people in a population, the, the higher their actuarial risk, the greater the in, kind of empirical probability that they're going to recidivate, um, the more services uh, we should apply if we want to get the best effect. And the implication is for low risk is we shouldn't be applying much of anything. And as the risk goes up, and there's good reasons for that that we've learned and uncovered in different studies um, that, that support that general finding, that simplistic finding, the higher the risk, the actual risk, the more the services. Um, so then the need principle is, uh, okay, so you know that the, <clears throat> you have an idea of what the quantum of services are that uh, might, might be warranted case by case. So where do you, what are those services? Where do you, where do you, um, uh, gather them. What, it, what is it? What are we talking about in terms of services? And um, that has proven to be that, you know, one of the um, uh, rubrics for that is that what they call a central eight. OK, so that there's eight, eight uh, Bonta again and Andrews identified in their meta-analysis along with Jean Drow that there's there's eight um, uh, primary or, um, you know, reliable areas of need with, with um, people on supervision 
um, whether that's in, in the institutions or out in the community, that um, uh, have a, a, a strong relationship to whether they're going to succeed in a, avoiding getting involved in the system again. And so the more, the, you know, the more prominent a person's needs are and the more that those prominent needs get addressed, the more satisfactory the outcome. So that's kind of in a nutshell, that need principle. And then responsivity, they talk about responsivity in two basic ways. One is primary responsivity is that primarily offender populations going throughout the literature on this, um, uh, what's shown to work most reliably is cognitive behavioral approaches, uh, not chat therapy, not psychoanalysis, not um, anything but simple uh, practice and rehearsal on fundamental skills. So cognitive behavioral you know, practice, coaching, or cognitive skill building, if you will, different kinds of curriculums have been around for Oh, well, well on 40 years now. I'm thinking about the one recent rehabilitation with Bob Ross, but many others have evolved and emerged over these, these years. So that's primary responsibility is that you want to be thinking in terms of providing services along those lines about skill practice. Then the, the secondary responsibility is that there's all kinds of potential uh, difference uh, individual variation and differences that may call for adjusting when you're providing the supervision or services for the, the clients. And those could be things like as um, sort of uh, basic and physical as they don't, they, they can't read they, and they need classes. Um, and that interferes with them getting employment, that interferes with them participating fully in some kind of treatment, some treatment um, programs because they can't read. Uh, it could also be that they've got, you know, particular um, uh, needs in terms of their gender or their gender orientation, that if you can provide uh, treatment that's sensitive to that, you're more likely to get better results. Um, and so there's a slew of these different kinds of potential conditions to look for. And we, and we kind of use think about them in terms of a checkoff list and just go down to see if any are present or you know, just flagging them. It's not to get it perfect. It's just make sure that we've looked at and uncovered, turned over as many possibilities as pos uh, as we can in the short time that we have in terms of providing setting up treatment, so that we're looking ahead <clears throat> and we're not going to get sandbagged by some um, un untoward kind of um, circumstances that we didn't anticipate. Um, and it's 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 a lot harder than talking about. Um, cause it, um, sometimes the client doesn't want us to understand or see what might be some of their responsivity issues. So, um, and then finally the professional override is that, uh, all said and done, we should leave room for doubt and, uh, and, and, and kind of carry a little bit of preoccupation with failure, you know, be sensitive that it's we don't have a, a, pat, a very solid pat hand and understanding. Um, neither does the client probably. And uh, between us, uh, sometimes we, we can make some, some good things happen, but just leave room for doubt and then be prepared to override when you, when you're, you just have a sense that this isn't the right situation. And especially when you can back it up in writing with making a couple statements about this is the reasoning or the logic that you're overriding the risk level, for instance, in the assessment or the kind of programming that might have been recommended because you're, you're going with some, uh, some other inside information, so to speak, that you have. And uh, systems that don't override or tolerate override tend to make a mess of things. Um, systems that override too much also kind of throw the whole, the whole strategy under the bus when they disregard what the protocols are here that I've been outlining, these, these four basic principles. I was just going to mention, Brad, I'm so glad you mentioned the override principle because that gets forgotten so often by practitioners and agencies. Um, today, I want to talk to you and do a deeper dive as we've <clears throat> pre-gamed on a little bit about, as you put it, the sanctimony of the need principle. Not so much to displace or replace it, but perhaps simplify it and hopefully foster some additional discussions. So 
to that end, why don't we begin with where you feel the Central Eight sit now within the context? Let's start out with um, the context of Godfrey and Hershey's 1990 book, A General Theory of Crime. All right. Well, I'd like to preface this with something I heard on the news last night. It was the news was about <clears throat> uh, pulling out of Afghanistan, and um, the commentator was um, on a bit of a tear. And he was, but but I think he, there was some truth to what he was saying. And he's saying that uh, according to the military's own uh, assessment, um, since we've been there. The operations has been disorganized, operationally disorganized, and um, it's been conceptually confused why we're there, what we're supposed to be doing. I would say that's quite also true of the criminal justice system, especially in our in my country in the U.S. Um, there's many things that we've been accused of, but being conceptually clear. <laughs> <laughs> And or operationally organized as aren't two of them. Um, and so uh, I because I started a long time ago when it was kind of like um, freewheeling back then in the beginning of the 70s. It was still in that kind of 60s mentality. And uh, Godber- uh, Martinson hadn't come out in 70 until 74. And that's when I started my second job in the criminal justice system. And, the, and the really the, the, the effects of that didn't take place for, you know, slowly for a few years following that. But um, so it was free and wheeling and then it started tightening down and then it became very, very narrow and looking at things like, um, you know, we had an expression, uh, trail them, nail them and jail them that kind of summed up the mindset and the mentality there, what we thought was serving public safety. And many, many, many good officers, um, including my uncle, thought that that had merit, that if they could intercept someone in their problem behavior before it got uh, manifested as in, in the form of serious crime, they were doing public some, some public safety good by pulling that person off the streets, even if it was usually just for a limited period of time and not looking at the bigger picture. So uh, that you might be disrupting their uh, a limited employment situation. You, you might be exposing them to more risky people in, in the jail or in the hold, holding place that they were in, et cetera, et cetera, which we're all now familiar with. So um, that's the background that I want to kind of suggests that we're not we're in a process that isn't finished and i just want to invite everybody i can to maybe join me in some um humility about what we know or don't know and um, sometimes the social constructionist knowledge is interesting it's such that when people have more vested interest in things they tend to solidify their understanding and model uh, and make it more portable, but also more profitable sometimes. So I, you know, you got to consider the source as much as possible. I believe when when it comes to social construction and knowledge, and really look at this openly. So here's my case. I'll, I'll make it first. Godfrey and Hershey. Um, they published in 1990 a general theory of crime and deviance. I was in graduate school at the time, and um, in the thick of it. And my graduate advisor, um, actually, uh, it just occurred to me recently, he's a master theory uh, th- theorist and an integrator of theories. His name is uh, Dr. Del Elliott. And um, uh, so he was into synthesizing and integrating theories big time at an international level. He was pre- preeminent at that level. Um, and then this and he had us as soon as this came out, he had his graduate students read this book. And then uh, I also followed it. I followed the, the fallout from that book for several years as a graduate student. And I stopped after two three ring manuals full of journal articles, rebuttals, challenges. It, that book caused a major, major um, tremor in criminological understanding. And here's what it was. It said, folks, it's Crime isn't that difficult to understand. It comes down to two things. The age of the person, 
the younger the age after after early adolescence, the younger the age, the more likely they're going to be involved in crime and wrong finger. Um, <clears throat> the um, the self-control or self-regulation skills of the individual. And that, that was one of the first times where they had access to big data to, to support and buttress their case. And when all two or three years later, when all the kind of um, clamor started uh, diminishing, it turned out that it was accepted an accepted tenant. Th those two things are the big dogs. Okay. So what does, why, why am I bringing this up? Because the R and R model was developed prior to the publication of um, Godfrey and Hershey's book um, prior to that kind of very conclusive uh, evidence and knowledge that low self-control is a major, major, the major, you might say, criminogenic need. And it's not found in the model that was formulated by uh, Bonta and <clears throat> Andrews. So what you see there is, um, I, it, well, it's not obvious. I think it is there latently. And I've talked to uh, uh, Dr. Bonta and Dr. Andrews before he passed away about this. And they acknowledged it was probably unfortunate timing that they, they didn't have insight into that at that time, that knowledge base that emerged in 1990. So what they have is a, the, a pretty good proxy, I think, for low self-control is criminal history. Most people look at criminal history as, well, that's static and you can't change that, right? Well, that's pretty true. I mean, you could increase the amount of criminal history. You could increase the amount of versatility in the history, but you can't really diminish what's happened already. All right. So um, what the, the developmental psychologists and theorists around low self-control say is that um, it manifests, one of its uh, most common manifestations is unruly behavior and AKA criminal behavior. And that you can, uh, another way that it manifests is accident proneness. Those are two very gross manifestations of low self-control. So you can look at the versatility of someone's criminal history, or you can look at the extensiveness of it to determine if there's, you know, that's a big juicy clue whether they have issues with low self-control or, or poor self-regulation. Those terms, as far as I can tell, are pretty synonymous. And what are we talking about when we're talking about low self-control? We're talking about a something that's developmental and it's exquisite. It's, a, it, 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 it's orchestral in its, uh, in its development. It's, it's over time. And we talk about people learning self-control and self-regulation skills in a sequence over time. And much of that development is occurring during adolescence, um, early adolescence, mid-adolescence, and late adolescence and into the mid-20s, which happens to coincide with the high-risk period for uh, involvement in criminal behavior. So most of us who are involved in criminal behavior of some type or another, whether it was shoplifting or soaping windows or doing something or, you know, a little bit more. I mean, it's a long continuum, but the research, you know, on uh, uh, the longitudinal research, you know, with, um, with representative samples of the population show that most of us were involved in it. And most of us, 80 percent or so, desisted by the time we hit mid-20s. So that J curve they talk about happens right in there at the same time that all this wonderful development's taking place. However, sometimes some of us miss some of the buses, the developmental buses, and we don't, we maybe we're just preoccupied with the, uh, you know, um, hormones and sexual politics, or we're getting involved in drugs at pre-algebra and we just kind of check out and we aren't really mindful of the shop anymore. And by the time algebra rolls around next year, we're hosed. We don't, we've missed that developmental bus, if, if you will, for finer abstract thinking, which is what it would really what algebra symbolizes. So, um, how does it, what we, signs or facets of low self-control are impulsivity, um, poor emotional regulation, uh, risk-taking, um, preference for simple tasks, uh, uh, preference for physical 
over mental activity, um, taking under perspective, poor consequential thinking, um, and uh, temper problems, flying off the handle, right? And and the list goes much is much larger. Yeah. There's much to be learned about this. So it's a mini headed hydra, low self control, and it's not in, explicit in the central eight. All right, that's that's the gist of what I want to I want us to consider how and what we need to do with this. How do we rectify this? Is this something that should be rectified? When I've presented this to two large audiences, once in Minnesota to a statewide conference and another to ICA, it was it went over like a wet, <laughs> you know, it, a lead balloon. To, it went over just like when I was first introducing R and R back in the in the uh, um, early '90s, the beginning of the '90s to probation officers. It, it, if it got any reaction, it was hostile or passive aggressive. And so the, I had a similar feeling when I started talking about, hey, look at this. This, um, And I haven't finished with it. My thesis is there's something was overlooked. There is something that we can do about it. And it will possibly pay dividends. It's not just remedying uh, cosmetics. It's not just correcting something uh, semantically. Um, you know, or getting it correct, it goes way beyond that. So, um, Joey, do you want to respond to something, anything I've said at this point, to, or, or should you just let me go on rattling on? Well, a, I could listen to you as you put it, rattle on forever. My wheels have been spinning here the whole time you've been speaking, Brad, and thinking. Um, full disclosure: Brad was my trainer when I got trained as an LSCMI uh, trainer. And again, Brad, when you talked about those things are not explicitly sort of housed within the r and framework, again, you mentioned criminal history, and that's when we talk about low self-regulation and, you know, arguably in that antisocial personality pattern, we will note that, well, it's reflective of that, but again, it's not, it doesn't have that sort of standalone, if you will, recognition that those other domains have up to and including leisure rec which i'll never forget once you and i were speaking and you referred to leisure rec as a wapf weak ass protective factor um, <laughs> so you know and, and that's kind of a segue to my next question we 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 put these these models out for practitioners to abide by without sometimes thinking what we're asking them to sort of you know operationalize so maybe talk about that very real difficulty with practitioners Again, wishing to operationalize the need principle in their daily work, um, but from differential diagnosis and subsequent negotiated goal setting, you know, and we can even talk about an agency's capacity issues. How much have we do we need to maybe re-explore? We're putting all this on on the plates of the practitioners and agencies, and we're sometimes maybe not seeing the forest from the trees, or as you put it, focusing on those larger things. And expecting staff to just go out and do this now. Well, I think as a model, R and R has a lot going for it, and it, the implication is differential diagnosis. Once, once you've gone, you've established the level of risk, and you go into need, it's time to differentiate what the, what need, right? And um, there's. Differential diagnosis in the hands of people that are really well trained um, could probably re work some really wonderful outcomes, right? Could result from that. Um, but uh, differential diagnosis in people that um, aren't trained and are o overburdened or have excessive workloads, you know, differential diagnosis is a term that fit for private therapy. It fit for therapists in institutions with small caseloads. It fit, but when you're talking about people that have caseloads of 40 or 50 or more, differential diagnosis becomes a consummate challenge. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the the differences between the the domains with any doesn't matter what the tool is. If it's a you know a differential risk need tool, it could be the compass, it could be the LSI, it could be you know the strong. It could there's many tools out there. But differentiating between um, one domain to the next when it's only the load 
and, and the resulting finished and scored assessment is only a few percentage points is questionable whether that's really valid or not. You know, it could be more a function probably of the itemization in the scale than it is the actual person that's being assessed. Officers aren't stupid. They pick up somewhere. They I think they understand this. Eh, maybe there's not that big a difference. Then when we get into weighted differential of diagnosis, where we assign weights, so sometimes this is done automatically in the software. Sometimes officers are just asked to kind of overlay in their thinking. The big four, right, um, so to speak, are more potent uh, than the the others. Certainly than the the, the lower two. Uh, so uh, employment education and uh, uh, leisure rec is what we're trained and told, and we, we can see the results in the meta analysis that have been conducted that those have smaller co significantly smaller coefficients to outcomes. So therefore, we weight differently. But then you're into a whole other um, layer of um, variation and noise potential as you're making this differential assessment now with a weighted, conducting a weighted one. Okay, then there's the actual fulfilling your conclusions, right? That this is the number one, this is the number two and number three. And when number one gets all better or get, we get good progress, we're going to drop back and work on two and three. And yet I've never really seen that happen very much. You know, in, in my years of experience in my own, uh, when I, I owned and ran two different licensed treatment agencies for offenders, I, I, I just think the time pressure, the workload pressure interferes there and it, and it renders that uh, model, which is, uh, has some really, you know, good logic and some good under, empirical underpinnings, notwithstanding the one I talked about, self-control being overlooked, that um, it's just too cumbersome. It's not. So that leads me to the, this kind of jump in logic is rather than try to be uh, okay or good enough at eight different domains, you know, in programming, why don't we just get good at a couple? And if I wanted to know which ones to get good at, well, as an empirist, I would look at the data, which I have done for 30 some years, looking at um, the results of instruments like the LSI and Compass. And what I've seen is consistent when it's system level data. It's not a special population, like we're gonna go in and assess sex offenders or we're gonna assess uh, you know, uh, domestic violence or something, You know, looking at that. When it's a general hetero heterogenic sample system data, representative sample, invariably, the high domains are criminal history and companions. Criminal history and companions. Criminal history, I'm sick of seeing it. It's always the same. Um, so uh, that would tell, suggest to me that maybe we look at that. And what are we talking when we talk about criminal history and companions? Essentially, I believe we're talking about low self-control and self-regulation, which is the mother of all these other problems, substance abuse, the problem of immediate gratification, adopting uh, criminal attitudes and orientation from others, all of that emanates out of low self-control because there's, there's so much liability when you're an adult and you have missed a number of buses developmentally that you're not, you, you, you don't have the same capacity to navigate and you're gonna get uh, marginalized more easily in various situations. You're gonna be more at risk if you get placed in an incarcerated setting to picking up more criminogenic uh, um, attitudes, to picking up more um, un, you know, uh, antisocial practices or skills. Um, it just, it, it, so low self-control, social support. Mm -hmm. So I call it social support, not companions, because I think that's the underlying essence of the domain and what we know about social support check this out it's the biggest moderator in all psychosocial treatment it doesn't matter whether people are there for phobias they're there for depression it doesn't matter what the biggest factor that moderates the outcome irrespective of the intervention is social support people that have good social support do better 
and people that don't, don't. What is good social support? We also have the benefit now of 50, 60 years of research on this topic. And it's where it's emerged and gone, again, with the help of big data, the Framington study, for instance, and other studies that just, uh, just are amazing to look at, um, the, how impactful social support is on our lives in day in and day out. And it, when you start unpacking it, there's a handful or two of very core principles that are worth understanding, which we have yet to really grapple with in our in our world, I think, adequately. And I say our world, I mean social services in general, education in general. So it's this big moderator. And what when it when it looks good, when it's working, it is bigger networks, more people that you see on a regular basis. And notwithstanding the size of your network, it is more disclosing people in your network, people that are comfortable being vulnerable with you. Mm-hmm. So this lets out a lot of cults, it lets out gangs, it lets out, fun, you know, rural fundamental, you know, you know the, the, while <clears throat> the, you may get a quick overnight increase in the size via those um, contexts, you don't get the self-disclosing vulnerability. So, and then the third criteria, which is to me, as good as mother's milk, is diversity. But it's diversity in its its total sense. It's not diversity like race, just racial diversity. It's diversity in age. It's diversity in education. It's diversity is the the more diverse someone's network, the more self-disclosing and the larger the network the more powerful it is in what they call direct effects of social support. Then there's the indirect or protective effects of social support. So they're both present with social support. Direct effects make help people increase their self-worth. They increase their um, flexibility. They increase their um, sense of agency and empowerment. Those are direct effects of social support. Buffering or indirect effects protect them, give them, provide them resiliency and the ability to spring back more quickly and more readily. So I would submit to a conversation and open and embrace anybody that wants to follow up and contact me or Joe or whatever and just say, can we talk more about this? Um, Is that we should maybe consider getting good at those two things and forget everything else basically. Not forget it. It's there. Treat it in nominally and address it when it's a, when it's acute. But but not get, that's not our core. I think our core in working with people to, that are marginalized and, <clears throat> and are at risk is to really um, learn about self-regulation skills and learn about social support. When we talk about the primary responsivity principle of working with CBT, there is a hand and glove fit to working with self-control. We have not surfaced that, that narrative fully yet. That's why it works. The evidence out there that was gathered through meta-analysis, after, you know, many, is, is very consistent. But what's the need that it's addressing has not been consistent. And I think it's a misunderstanding to focus on the flower or even the fruit for that matter, antisocial attitudes, Mm -hmm. rather than the roots, which is low self-control. So low um, self-control is not easy and it's not gonna be fun for a lot of people to to square away with and work on, but it's a very doable um, development process, even off time. Which, which offenders are. So, I mean, that's, that's where I come in. And the last thing I, I would like to say, if, I've got, if we've got just a minute here, is just put a plug in for a couple things. One is um, the, the uh, a fantastic book, Working with Difficult Clients, uh, um, by uh, Fred Hanna. So <clears throat> I want to make sure that I cited that therapy with difficult clients and Fred introduces the, what's called the precursor model. And the precursors are the building blocks of change, according to him. 
and he's got fantastic methods. Uh, it's published by the American Psychological Association, and uh, he's done videos for them, the APA, and and showing how that the to the difficult clients really are clients that just don't have many precursors. And so the challenge is finding which ones do they lack the most. It's not a, it's not a strength based model. It's a deficit model, which ones are, are they most in need of and, and start helping them get that support under themselves. So the, so a necessity, a sense of necessity for change is a mindset. Willingness to experience anxiety is a mindset and I find that that one is crippling many times, many high-risk offenders. As big and bad as they look, inside, they are scared to death of undergoing what the confrontation with themselves and their own thinking and attitudes. Another one that's not a mindset, it's a it's part of an executive function. It, it's a metacognition, is um the uh, awareness developing being coming open and aware requires us to tell our executive function to slow the heck down and and grapple with what's in pay attention to what's in front of you awareness otherwise i'm on fast thinking i'm on automatic and i'm not going to pay any attention i'm glib charming and superficial as they say in uh <laughs> factor uh one of psychopathy um Another one is confronting the problem. Another, it's an executive function as well as effort. So I've been looking at these in myself as well as in clients and workers and whatnot. And those are things that we can train or show people how to turn on and off, how to work with, uh, assuming they don't have uh, frontal lobe damage. So <clears throat> um, as well as the mindsets, the seventh out of the seven precursors is Social support. <laughs> and we're back full circle, right? Finally, the last thing is that it, we, uh, prior to Bandura, or coterminous with Bandura, was someone named Dick Jesser, uh, developing in the late 50s and the early 60s at the Institute of Behavioral Science that, uh, a theory of that explains problem behavior. It's called problem behavior theory, and you can Google it, and you'll drop into Alice in Wonderland there. And part of it is predicated on this. Part of the model and the intricacies of the theory is that people acquire risk and, and protective factors developmentally. That's a developmental process that's ongoing through our through our lives. And that when the ratio of protective to risk factors shifts significantly, it predicts or precipitates the onset of criminal behavior, right, or deviant behavior. Conversely, when that ratio reverses significantly, it predicts desistance from crime and behavior. And it's so eloquent, this theory, and it's been validated in so many different countries and different with different cultures because it's a function of the the Institute of Interdisciplinary Behavior is, is an interdisciplinary institute over at CU. That's uh, a massive um, institute that's been there, but it's all ivory tower. It doesn't come down to the, the mid-range theories and the things that we do. And it doesn't, but when you look at how it addresses and looks at the causes and conditions of low self-control and social support, and how they factor in in various types of risk or protective factors, it is eloquent. And we have not been able to share this. We have not been able to bridge this to our field yet. And we really, I think it were, it's worth looking into. We go by what's easiest. We take the path of least resistance. That's what I do. I think that's what everybody does generally, especially in trying to, in uncertain times, you know. But that doesn't get us out of, Afghanistan without harm. We need, we need to be more thoughtful. Thank you. Brad, normally when I'm um, either in the room with you listening to you or listening to you via some other medium, I'm taking copious notes, which I had to resist the urge here to take notes and keep reminding myself, Joe, this is being recorded. You can go back and listen to, to all these nuggets later. Um, not to put you on the spot, but I just enjoy talking to you and learning from you so much, Brad. I would love to have you back to unpack some of these things we really could do a deeper dive on just problem behavior theory in and of itself. The other thing I wanted to note, note when you were speaking, 
I spoke with uh, Dr. Bonta a few months back, if not longer. And he mentioned to me almost in passing that, you know, Joe, we're really, we've gone from the big four and it's, we're really talking about the big two, which are peers and criminal thinking, which as you noted, the root of that is really that low self-regulation. So I, I couldn't agree more with you about, we need to, again, almost sort of take some of that off the plate of the practitioner, strip it down and say, you know, whatever the old commercial was, we do one thing and we do it well, or in this case, we, we're going to focus on two things and we're, and we're going to do it well. Jim, Jim Collins, I think good to great. He had a, in there a chapter on the hedgehog principle, yeah. you know, and that the hedgehog is, is really a very old mammal. Uh, in, in terms of evolution, and it survived primarily because it does one thing really well. It rolls into a ball and it protects itself when it's threatened. End of story. You know, and if we could get that way, and I believe we could with social support, I know we could, is develop, because there's lots of chops that we could de- develop and use that we aren't, and it's easy to measure over time. Social support does not um, elude us into like self-regulation or antisocial attitudes. It's not that elusive. It's very concrete and tangible. Um, and there's many techniques that let, lend themselves to tracking that data. We could get really good, remarkably good at it and do our local communities and our population and our stakeholders a really great service by getting good at that as well as self-regulation skills. Yeah, you're right. I think the foundation is there of how we've, again, sort of driven home the point of of peers. But I love how you frame it as social support, which folks in the desistance camp do as well. Whereas, and this is probably an oversimplification, but I think too often with the risk-need responsivity model, we think of peers and it's just sort of whack-a-mole, make your negative gangster peers go away. But we don't talk about augmenting pro-social supports, or as you put it, really looking for folks who are going to be driving those buses, as you say, those sort of off-ramps, I think we really need to reimagine how we look at social support and not simply, again, negating negative peers. I, I would love to be a part of any, any any conversation about that with you, Joe. I mean, I just, I feel strongly about it. And it's been my... Um, in in terms of my own learning and journey, but it's also been part of my experience. The reason I left after three weeks in 1971 was low self-control. Quite, you know, my girlfriend had graduated the the drug treatment program, the year-long drug treatment program, a few weeks before me, and um, I couldn't handle being alone without her and left, you know. And so I've I've what I'm talking about is something that I've experienced um, at on the street level um, prior to 1971 in spades. And I know that it's doable, you know, but uh, it's not it's hard to persist. And it would be so much more helpful if systems would um, look more closely at what the needs are uh, rather than the model. Uh, uh, that that we're dealing with. Yeah, again, I couldn't agree more. And I love, as you said, that I think folks can relate to their own experiences, their struggles, their journeys when it comes to their experiences with social support and how it changed their trajectories, whether whether deviant or not. But again, that's what that's the appeal, I yeah. think. But I know we're up against the clock with time. I'd love to have you back on the show. In the meantime, what I will do is leave the link for JSAT in the show notes of this episode. Um, I'll probably find a link for Fred Hanna's book and put that in there as well. And then, yeah, hopefully you'll be back and we can, we can continue this fantastic conversation. Joe, thank you very much. Always, thank you. Always a pleasure have to have see you. Brad. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Tired of those pesky risk factors fed up with those nagging periods of reoffending just can't seem to keep on the straight and narrow. Then try CriminoGuard. CriminoGuard is our patented repellent against criminogenic need. CriminoGuard is effective against the risk factors of delinquent past, dysfunctional family relationships, substance misuse, lack of pro-social leisure activities, deficits around education and employment, negative peers, pro-criminal attitude, and a history of antisocial personality pattern. Simply apply CriminoGuard at the onset of delinquent behavior or when actual risk assessment warrants application. 
Criminal Guard works by attacking criminogenic need at the source while buffering against future risk. Inspired by general personality and cognitive social learning theory, Criminal Guard identifies criminogenic need at its source. Then our top secret byproducts mimic pro-social modeling to elicit the onset of pro-social behavior. Once the cost for antisocial behavior outweighs the rewards, users begin seeing reductions in criminal deeds. Criminal Guard is available in regular, mint, or jasmine scent. Find Criminal Guard at all quality vendors, shops, and strip malls. Criminal Guard is not a substitute for proven evidence-based practices. Criminal Guard may cause mild discomfort or skin rash. In case of continued maladaptive behavior, users should subject themselves to proven core correctional practices. Criminal Guard has failed to result in significant effect sizes in recidivism reduction. Buyer beware, not sold in Canada. (laughs) A huge thank you once again to Brad Bogue for sharing his insights with us. So much I could reflect on and attempt to unpack, which is why I sincerely hope Brad will join us again on the show at some future point. In the meantime, I will be doing some heavy-duty reflecting on his thoughts, particularly those around narrowing our focus down to low self-regulation and social support and getting really, really good at addressing those risk factors. What would that look like from the perspective of the practitioner and, of course, the client? This ties to the point Brad made as to differential diagnoses, which for quite some time I've wondered about as to what we are tasking our probation officers to take on. I have left a link for Brad's company, JSAT, in the show notes of this episode. Additionally, I have also left a link for the Fred Hanna book, which Brad referenced, Therapy with Difficult Clients, Using the Precursors Model to Awaken Change. Go ahead and check that out. You heard Brad say he's open to conversations on this topic. You can reach out to Brad if you visit his JSAT website, or of course, you can contact Brad through the show by utilizing our email of the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. That's the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. Back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show directly or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to evidence based practices or implementation, or of course, the topic of desistance from crime. Remember to follow us through our Facebook page and our Instagram page at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is also on t- Twitter. Go ahead and give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C R I M Media Group. Give us a follow. You can also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. And if you believe in what we're doing, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word, tell a friend or a coworker about us, ask them to subscribe to the show, and of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review. And thanks for listening. The thoughts, statements, and opinions of the host and cast members do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers and are those of the host and cast themselves. Any discussion regarding client statements, behaviors, actions, or crimes are purely fictional and are used only for the purposes of example. Any examples that could be deemed to be related to an actual individual 
or individuals are incidental.